Welcome to the IT for Dental Professionals webinar series. My name is Derek Watson. I'm a dentist with a keen interest in IT and I hope that I can show you it's not something that you need to be afraid of. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. If anything's unclear, then please watch again and why not forward the link to anyone else you think may benefit. Let's have a look at what we're going to cover in the fifth and penultimate webinar in this series. Apart from sending and receiving email, browsing the web is probably what most people spend most of their time doing. Its full name is the World Wide Web and because it's a proper name it's capitalized but a lot of people just call it the internet. So just remember that there is no difference between the internet and the web in common usage. I tend to prefer calling it the web and I capitalize the W and I call them websites rather than websites with a small w because I'm a bit pedantic but you can call them whatever you want they're all the same thing. To browse the web you're going to need a client which is the new name for a computer program and there are many web browsers and all of them are free. The three main ones are Internet Explorer from Microsoft, Firefox which is written by Mozilla and Chrome which is written by Google. The first thing you're going to ask is which is the best? Well they all browse the web without any problems. Google Chrome likes to think it's the fastest, although most of the time you won't notice a big difference. Mozilla Firefox comes with lots of plugins which are like apps that allow you to tailor and increase its functionality, although Chrome also does that. And Internet Explorer is the one that I use when neither of the other two will work, so my advice is to install all three. Thanks to a new directive from the European Union, all websites are supposed to draw our attention to the fact that they leave small files on our computer called cookies. This allows them to see whether we are a first time customer or what sort of goods we are interested in so they can target their advertising. You might notice this for example when you look at lawnmowers on Amazon and then visit a completely different website and the first advert you see is for a lawnmower. They've responded to this by putting big banner adverts on their websites. You might think that these have been deliberately designed by programmers to be more intrusive and annoying than the cookies. I couldn't possibly comment. Talking of tracking, you may find that your email client doesn't display pictures and will say something to the effect that it has prevented automatic download of some pictures in this message. This is because you haven't been sent the pictures, only the text. The pictures are waiting on the sender's computer and if you request them they will know that you have opened their mail. Because you may not want someone who is sending you junk emails, otherwise known as a spammer, to know your email address is monitored by you, your email client will ask you for permission before fetching the picture part of any email. If you right click and select the option to download the pictures, it will look a lot better, but the sender will know that you've opened it. In this way they can keep track of who opened their emails, what time of day was most popular and even try out two or three headlines to see which one got opened more often. Personally I'm pretty relaxed about this sort of tracking, however what you can do is set up one of your web clients, for example Chrome, to never accept cookies and use that most of the time and revert to something like Internet Explorer if you visit a website that won't work without cookies enabled. There is a special mode in most web browsers in which cookies and browser history are not retained. In Google Chrome this is called incognito. Of course if you're not all that bothered then you can ignore all of this, install one web browser and use it all the time on the default settings, download all the pictures in your emails and you almost certainly won't come to any serious harm. Keep in the back of your mind that someone in the UK government reads all of your email, listens to all of your telephone calls both landline and mobile and keeps a record of which websites you visited and when. This is in addition to tracking you on CCTV every time you drive your car on a motorway or visit a town centre and recording when you leave or enter the country. In fact anyone with a computer linked to the internet can intercept your emails, which is why it's important that you never send any confidential information in an unencrypted email. If you have a requirement to send confidential information on a routine basis, for example you work for the NHS and send patient data, then you will be a member of NHSnet which has built in encryption. But the average small dental practice is not a member of NHSnet, so what do you do? 
The majority of practices ignore this problem. That is, they either send data unencrypted or they just don't send confidential information, which I suppose is slightly better. There is no generally adopted end-to-end -end solution for email encryption. You can use a web-based email service like Hushmail or a client like PGP Desktop or New PG, but I'm not going to go any further because the subject of encryption should be the topic of a future webinar. You can send documents via unencrypted mail if the documents themselves are encrypted. So you can send an encrypted spreadsheet or an encrypted Word document. You can zip up any file or group of files in an encrypted zip file. But please send the file in one email and the password in another. There is very little chance of anyone except the government intercepting both emails and getting the data and the password. The encryption in Word and Excel is much better than it used to be, so just having the file on its own is not going to be much use to a third party, because the cost of cracking the code and obtaining the information is almost certainly going to be more than the data's worth. One service that the government can't crack at the moment is Skype. This is because, like BlackBerry Messenger, the young criminal's messaging system of choice, it has its own built-in encryption. So at the moment, it is totally confidential for both calls and messages. If you're going to send your bank details to someone, I suggest Skype, or a simple SMS text, or, at worst, an old-fashioned fax. All are pretty secure, but that is all going to change with the introduction of the Communications Data Bill, which is going through Parliament. At the moment, the government can watch anybody. In the future, they'll be able to watch everybody. But enough politics. Let's get back to basics. The web is stored on computers all over the world that talk to each other. So if you ask your internet service provider's computer something and it doesn't have the answer, which it probably won't, then it has to talk to its friends, who talk to their friends until they work out where the information is and one by one they fetch it all the way back and deliver it to your PC, tablet or smartphone. This usually takes a second or two, but you will find that it takes longer at certain times of day. For example, at 5 p.m. local time, Everyone who is at work gets ready to go home and presses send receive on their email to make sure they have cleared their outbox. Similarly, everybody who is working on producing web content uploads it to the web before they go home. The net result of this is that there can be a tremendous surge in net traffic around 5 o'clock. If you can't log on to your email or the internet seems to be working very slowly, look at the clock and you'll probably find it's 5 o'clock slowdown. Similarly, at 9.30 p.m., the kids have been put to bed and all the mums and dads get a chance to go on the web, so there is another bottleneck around 10 p.m. This is a snapshot of activity from the online game service Steam, taken at about 5.44 p.m. yesterday. The chart axis says that it's 8.44 in the morning, but that's because it's based in the U.S. in a different time zone. If you look at the U.K. times in my labels, you can clearly see that the number of service users is on an upward trend from about 8 o'clock in the morning. At about 6 p.m. it had 4.9 million users online with another million set to come online once they finish their homework and it normally peaks at around 8.30 p.m. when they have to brush their teeth and go to bed. So the chances are that when you want to use the web everybody else will as well. This is no different to roads or beaches, and the solution is the same. Use them at 3 o'clock in the morning when everyone else is in bed. If you don't fancy that, then at least use them in the morning when America is in bed. It doesn't matter about Asia, because they use the web when we're in bed. Or they have no internet, or they have fiber optic access, which means they don't suffer from bottlenecks. Which brings me to the topic of speed. In order to avoid getting ripped off by your internet service provider, you need to know a couple of things about speed. If you understand miles per hour, you'll have no problems with this. A bit is simply a zero or a one. That's all computer memory can store. Zero or one, off or on. Put a thousand bits together and you get a kilobit. The same way as a thousand grams makes a kilogram, or a thousand meters makes a kilometer. Put a thousand kilobits together and you've got a megabit. Mega means million. Put a thousand megabits together and you've got a gigabit. Giga means billion. That's it. That's all you need to know. Bit, kilobit, megabit, gigabit. Each one a thousand times larger than the previous one. 
My first computer had 8 kilobits of memory. My current one has 8 gigabits. So it's a billion times larger. Let's go back to the cheesy graphic we used in the previous webinar to illustrate a local network. How fast are the devices talking to the router? If you look at my network information, you'll see that it's going at 1 gigabit, or 1 billion bits per second. This is shown as 1.0 Gbps. Let's put that information on our graphic. The network attached storage is built for speed, so it's likely to be talking to the network at 1 gigabit per second as well. But Mum is using a Wi-Fi connection. What speed is she getting? This depends on the speed of the Wi-Fi, both at the router and also at her computer. There is one Wi-Fi standard and it keeps increasing in speed. Currently it's common to find Wi-Fi at 54 megabits per second and it's quite rare to find the faster 300 megabits per second. So if we assume mum is getting 54 megabits then it will also be reduced by the distance between her and the router and interference from things like microwave ovens. So she may only be getting half of that or less. If she's averaging 20 megabits a second, she's only getting 1 50th of the speed she would do if her computer was plugged in using an Ethernet cable. So always use a cable connection if you can. Wi-Fi is for convenience, not for speed. However, Mum's connection is like greased lightning compared to the speed of the web. These are a couple of speed tests I did last night. And you can see that I was downloading on average at just under 1 megabit per second. That is just one thousandth of the speed of my gigabit network and one fourteenth of the speed that I'm being charged for. I made a call to my ISP's technical support line and was told that there were no technicians available. But the telephone call had the desired effect and this morning my connection jumped up magically to the correct speed. And you can see that the speed test result matches the actual download speeds being reported by my other software because 13,239 kilobits is about 13 point something megabits. So it pays to keep a check of your internet speed through sites like speedtest.net. Internet service providers can make big money by shaving your connection speed and selling it to someone else. So complain if you're not getting what you're paying for. Just make sure that nobody else in the house is using the network when you test it. Another lesson from this is that unless you're shifting large amounts of data around your network, you probably don't need a gigabit network and one running at 100 megabits would be fine. The reason why your 20 megabit Wi-Fi connection is okay is because it's probably going three to four times faster than your web connection. The web connection is the bottleneck. How do you know if it's safe to give your details to a website? Well, you don't. There is a protocol for encrypting data between your computer and a website. It happens automatically and you can tell if you're using it because the website begins with HTTPS instead of the usual HTTP. This is a very small difference. So most web browsers will highlight it in some way to emphasize the fact that it is an encrypted site. They will also emphasize the website name so you can check quickly if you are on the correct site. Being encrypted doesn't mean that your details are secure as a hundred million people who entrusted their details to Sony found out when Sony's website was hacked. But if you stick to mainstream sites that are household names, then you can't go far wrong. If you're using an unknown website, a simple test is to see if they have a physical address. Here, in addition to a registered address, they have a telephone number, so this site is unlikely to be bogus. Every website you visit asks you to create an account. If you use the same name and password for all of them, then if one of your accounts is compromised, they all are. It's not likely to be the website operator that causes problems because even the owner doesn't have access to the user passwords, which is why if you lose your password, you have to reset it yourself. This is the password generating screen from a commercial program called RoboForm. In the first example, I've asked it to generate an eight character password using only uppercase letters and numbers. In the middle example, I've asked it to include lowercase letters in the mix, which greatly increases the number of combinations and makes it much more secure. In the last example, I've asked it to use some additional non-alphabetic and non-numeric characters, such as opening and closing brackets. 
This is about as secure as you need to get with passwords. The first example would be much easier to enter on a smartphone or tablet, so you have to decide what sort of security you need. The next thing you need is some software to remember all the passwords and enter them automatically, and Roboform does this as well. Roboform is available in a version that will run from a USB key. That means that you can plug it into any computer, select a website from Roboform, and it will go to that website, log in for you, and leave you inside the site ready to start work without having pressed a key or remembered a single password. It will also enter your details on web forms so you don't have the bother of constantly filling out your name and address, telephone number and credit card details every time you want to buy something. And, as we've seen, it also invents passwords for you. Because this is all handled by Roboform behind the scenes, your passwords can be fiendishly secure. And you could have 500 of them, all different, something you could never do normally. Just remember to buy the Roboform to go version, it's something I use every day uh, and you can get it on a free trial. If you want a free alternative, there is KeyPass which is not so fully featured, but it is completely free. Every dental practice needs a website and the steps in setting one up are pretty easy. Here they are. You will probably choose to subcontract this work and I don't blame you, but to avoid getting ripped off it's useful to know what's involved in each step, so I'll just take you through each one. Anyone can buy a name for their website from a site such as 123reg.co.uk. You can see that it costs about £3.49 a year to own a name that ends in .co.uk. The trick is to find a good one that hasn't already been taken. I'm going to set up a website for my fictional practice, Tiptree Dental, so I type tiptreedental.co.uk into the search box. And, fortunately, nobody has taken my preferred name. So for the princely sum of £6.98, I can buy that name for two years and then keep renewing it for as long as I like. You might like to buy one or two of the other names to stop anyone setting up a rival site, but generally the .com and .co.uk should be sufficient. You may have noticed that a website's name is called the domain. Now you need to get your domain hosted somewhere, that is, on a computer that's permanently connected to the web. There are plenty of hosting companies. This is a typical comparison site. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but you pays your money and takes your choice. Let's have a look at their favourite company, HostPapa. You can see that HostPapa is charging £1.95 a month to host your website. You may notice that they are offering to register your domain free. But if you let them do that, then it will belong to them and not to you, so I don't advise that. They do offer unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, unlimited email and a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you browse a bit further down, you can see that they offer to install software automatically that you can use to build your site easily. They give you a choice of WordPress, Joomla, Drupal or their own product, Soho Launch. Any of these would be more than adequate to build a website for a dental practice. Search engine optimization is about coming top of the list when people are looking for you on the web. In dentistry, it is not so important. If you think about it, when somebody types find me a dentist into Google, they're not going to go to a dentist in the middle of the Sahara Desert just because it was top of the list. What patients want is to be able to find you when they're looking for you. Unless there are two tip tree dental surgeries in the same town, then I'm not going to be too worried about people finding my website. Google is very good at giving people the information they want and not giving them the information you want them to have, which is what search engine optimization experts will have you believe that you can do. In every web page there is a space for some keywords and a description of the page. Providing you fill these in, there's not a lot more that you can do. In fact, most software for building websites will do this automatically for you. For example, here is the screen from Joomla that prompts you to type in a description and some keywords for the page that you're creating. This simple technique has allowed us to retain the top three slots on Google for the Query Dental Professionals Association, beating the BDA into fifth place 
behind the Canadian Dental Association. That is out of three and a half million possible matches. Of course, if you type British Dental Association, then they come top. But that's what search engines are supposed to be all about, finding what you're looking for. If you're particularly astute, you may have noticed that we have bought our domain, set up our website, and still got change out of a tenor. And that's what your web designer will pay. But it's not what he or she is going to charge you. To be fair, you are paying for design and coding skills. And it does take some time to set up a website. About a day. Because it's all done by templates and subcontractors of the third world. A bit more if you want bespoke photography. So be prepared to negotiate hard on price. Bandy about words like domain and hosting and tell them you could get the whole thing done for less than a tenner because Derek Watson told you so. A good web design firm will register the domain in your name. If they don't, it's possible they may have an eye to holding you to ransom further down the line. To summarise, we looked at safety and security on the web and the speed of networks, when to trust a website, how to use secure passwords easily and lastly the steps involved in setting up your own website. Next week will be the last in the series and because it's Christmas I'm going to give you all a present by showing you how to get all the software you will ever need legally free of charge. How to pretend that you're in the office when you're at home pruning the roses and finally how to disappear into the cloud. That about wraps it up for today. So thanks for your time and attention.